Today we're starting a new series called He's Coming. Amen. Find that kind of interesting, right? Um, Emmanuel <laughs> is coming. <laughs> Only God can orchestrate, you know, little, little things uh, like that. Uh, seriously, we are talking about uh, the coming of, of the Savior, the coming Messiah, and we know that uh, looking in the rearview mirror to be none other than Jesus Christ. And listen, he's not only coming then, but guess what? He's coming again. And that gives us hope, that gives us assurance, that gives us confidence. Listen, there's, there's sometimes uh, things happen that you know that something is, is coming. Christmas is, is right around the corner. And when it's September and you walk into Home Depot to buy a hammer and you are bombarded with Christmas decor, you know Christmas is coming. When the weather starts to get a little bit cooler and you wake up on a nice brisk 40-degree uh, morning, you know Christmas is coming. When you start to crave a Texas bowl of chili, you don't do that in July or August, do you? But you know that Christmas is coming. How many of you have your Christmas decorations already out? Anybody got the tree up? Okay, there's, there's a few of you. Uh, I want to show you my Christmas decorations. Here's a picture of my personal Christmas decor. It's still in the shed where it belongs until Thanksgiving. Who's with me on that one? Yeah, there we go. All right. It's not a debate, but we win, okay? There's just some things that, that happen that even if you didn't know the calendar, you didn't know the time, you didn't know the season, you would just know, hey, there's something that's, that's coming. And I want you to know that there was an expectation. There was an anticipation of uh, the people, the, the, the people of God, the Israelites, before the coming Savior. There was a, an expectation that he was coming. But what is he coming as? We're going to talk about some things over the next uh, six weeks leading up to Christmas. And today, um, we're going to start with a big one. I want you to know right off the bat, he's coming as king. He came as king. Guess what? He's coming as king. And this is good news for us. We don't have to elect him into office. Okay, he sits on that throne. He is the king. Look, um, here's today's message. Uh, I'm going to tell you two stories. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to ask you a question. All right, if you're like, want to track where we're going, um, here's where we are. I'm going to tell you two stories. I'm going to make a statement, and then I'm going to ask you a, a question, and we're going to worship um, again. So here's, here's the first story. In the beginning... God created a kingdom. God created a kingdom, and he called this kingdom earth. And God took some of that earth, and he breathed life into it, and he formed a man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He breathed life into dirt and created Adam. That's a miracle, right? Now, God gave Adam some very specific instructions, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and rule it. So Adam, listen, Adam was supposed to be a, uh, uh, a steward on behalf of the king. Adam was not the king, but Adam was called to steward the kingdom on behalf of the king. Now, since God is the king, guess what? God gets to tell Adam how to run the kingdom. Fair enough, right? So here's how God says uh, to rule the kingdom. You can eat from this tree, and you can eat from that tree, and you can eat from this tree, and you can eat from all these trees, but don't eat from this tree. There was a lot of freedom, wasn't there, for Adam and for Eve. But God said, don't eat from this tree or you will die. Now, over time, Adam began to think that he could run the kingdom better than the king. So what did he do? He disobeyed the king. And he ate from the tree that he was not supposed to eat from. And he brought in with it, with that disobedience, he brought in it destruction and chaos. And we can't forget that the chaos that we see in the world today is all rooted in that one original sin. Now, um, because God is a just king, God must allow mankind to experience the consequences of their disobedience. And the consequences for Adam was death. The, the penalty, the wage, the earnings 
for sin is death. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. There was a spiritual death, and later on in their life, there was a very real physical death. Their bodies decayed. Decay is a result of sin. And God must allow that to happen because he is a just king. But I have good news. God is also a loving king. And because God is a loving king, he provides a way for restoration. He provides a way for Adam and his kids and his descendants and all the peoples of the earth to be blessed. What was God's plan? He's going to send another king. A king that would restore the kingdom that Adam lost. If you're with me, say I am. This is the message of the gospel from the very beginning. This is the story. This is why it's so important for us to to get out of the New Testament and start at the very beginning. Because the Bible is not these disconnected stories, but when we see it from a big picture, we begin to understand that there is a work that God is doing that's that's big, that's, that's worldwide. And so God has a plan to restore the kingdom. Turn to your neighbor and say, restore the kingdom. This is important. We're going to come back to that later. All right, but first I want to tell you a second story. I, I skipped over a verse. We're going to be in lots of places um, of the Bible if you want to catch up with me. We're going to be in 2 Samuel 7, um, John 18, Isaiah 9, um, Revelation 19, Hebrews 3. We'll get there. Uh, Psalm 47, verse 2. For the Lord, the Most High, is awe-inspiring, a great king over the whole earth. So God creates a kingdom. Man jacks up the kingdom. God's going to restore the kingdom. Can you say jacked up at church? Is that okay? <laughs> I said it twice. <laughs> Second story. God looks at a man named Abram and says, I'm going to make you into a nation. Just like God takes the dirt and handles it and says, I'm going to make you into a man. God looks at a man and says, and now I'm going to make you into a a nation. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. This nation will be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea stores. I'll give you a nightly reminder and a daily reminder so you'll never forget, I made a promise and I keep my promises. We'll call this nation a kingdom, a house. This is called the house of Israel. Psalm 135, verse 4 says, For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, as his treasured possession. God chooses a man to turn turn him into a nation so that he can interact with this nation to show all the other nations, this is how I operate. Israel is not the king. They are to steward the kingdom on behalf of the king. Now, since God is the king, guess what? He gets to tell Israel how to run the kingdom. So what does he tell them? Don't have any other gods. Don't make an idol. That's dumb. Don't take my name in vain. I'm serious. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Don't kill. It's not good. Don't commit adultery. It's a holy regret. Don't uh, uh, steal. Don't cheat. Don't covet. Don't lie. This is how I want you to operate in the kingdom. And guess how long it took Israel to reject that? All of that, right? You come down, they've already got a golden calf, you know? And then they start lying about it. I didn't do this. We just, we put gold in the fire and poof, out popped a cow. (laughs) I've got lots of tweetables today, don't I? (laughs) Out popped a cow. Israel rejects the king's instructions. By rejecting the king's instructions, guess what? You're rejecting the king. And we see the clearest picture of that later on as Israel grows into that nation that God promised they would be, and they cried out to Samuel, we want a king. What are they doing? They're rejecting God as king. Samuel didn't want to do it. God has to speak to Samuel. This is 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. He says, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me as their king. So what does God say? He says, give them a king. They anoint King Saul, bad choice, right? From all the worldly perspective, he seemed like the right guy. He stood a head taller than everybody else. He was a good-looking guy. He was a leader. Um, Seemed like a logical choice. But he wasn't the man after God's own heart. God passes him off to the side, and he raises up a young shepherd boy named David to be the king. This is the man after God's own heart. And because of that, 
Um, David has his heart for God. He wants to build God a house. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? He wants to build God a house, and God says, no thanks. I don't want you to build me a house. I don't need a house. I've been living in a tent, you know, for all these years. Not really living in a tent, but I've been meeting with people in a tent. Um, and David's like, no, I really want to build you this, this permanent. It's going to be awesome. And God's like, no, I don't want it. And here's what God says to Samuel. No, sorry, David. Second Samuel um, chapter 7. Uh, the end of verse 11, the Lord himself will make a house for you. Verse 12, when your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant. Is the descendant plural or singular? Singular. I'll raise up one descendant who will come from your body, means this is going to be your child, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, we see the fulfillment of this um, in two ways. Number one, we see it through the very next generation of Solomon. David has a son through his own body, right? This is his own child named Solomon. Solomon becomes king. This is the first time in all of Israel's history this has happened. Now, over in England, you know, you, you've got a king, you've got a queen, and, and it's usually their, their child that, that kind of raises up and, and inherits the throne, right? We're kind of used to that. They weren't used to that. This was like, you're the king until you die, and someone else is either going to kill you and take the kingdom or... That's probably it, right? They're going to kill you and take the kingdom. And so God says, I've got a special deal for you, David. I'm going to raise up your own son who's going to inherit the kingdom, and I'm going to establish this kingdom on your behalf. Now, that, hap that happened exactly as God promised. Verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name. Question, did Solomon build God a house? The answer is yes. He built him a temple. Sticks and bricks, gold and silver, beautiful place. This was the place that God would come to interact with his people. This is the place where the people would go to make sacrifices and interact with God. And he says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Is Solomon sitting on the throne forever? No. So listen, we then lean in and say, okay, God, what's going on here? This has a a double fulfillment. It has an immediate fulfillment through David's son, Solomon. So this lets the people know, I can trust God. But it has a future fulfillment in the man of Jesus Christ. So let's, let's put it to the test. Did Jesus Christ build a house for God? The answer is yes. Join, join me. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 3. This is not on the screen Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Listen, that's all I'm asking you to do today. I'm asking you to consider Jesus as king. I'm asking you to think about that. Consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. Who appointed him? That's God. Jesus was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses was in all of, in all of God's household. Just as Moses was faithful, guess what? Jesus was also faithful to the one who appointed him. Verse 3, for Jesus considered worthy of more glory. Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Verse 4, now every house is built by someone. I love statements like this at the Bible, like they're so simple. It's like, duh. <laughs> every house is built by someone. Houses don't build themselves. Earths don't put themselves together either, by the way. Every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. It's about to get good. Verse 5, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household. Moses was a faithful what? Servant in God's household. Let me repeat that. Moses was a servant in God's household. Verse 8, but Christ was faithful as a son over the household. Did you catch that? What was Moses he was a servant in the household. Who's Jesus? He's a son over the household. The Hebrew writer is saying, Jesus is the king. They're looking at it in hindsight. They got it immediately after the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We get it. He is the king, not a servant in the household. He's the son over the household. Now, here's what it says next. And we are that household. We're the household. Let me tell you something. The church is the household that Jesus built. Whew. Far more spectacular. Far more amazing. 
far more beautiful than the temple that Solomon built. Jesus told Peter upon this confession, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And 2,021 years later, guess what? The house still stands because Jesus is the king. He establishes, God establishes his throne forever. Did I read that back in 2 Samuel? Yeah, he will establish the kingdom forever. That's the kingdom of Jesus. It would not be a temporary kingdom like that, would, that King Solomon led. It would be a forever kingdom. Jesus is the king. So they were anticipating a king. That was about 2,000 years when uh, David lived before Jesus, about 700 years before Jesus. God raises up a prophet named Isaiah in Isaiah chapter uh, 7, makes a uh, prophecy about the coming Messiah. And he says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. Was a child given to us? Or, no, sorry. Was a child born to us? Yes. Was a son given to us? Yes. Is the government resting on his shoulders? Not yet. So we know that this is still yet to come. We know that the king is still coming. There's still work to do. There's a restoration work because you said earlier, you told your neighbor, God's plan is to restore the kingdom. Jesus did that on the cross. He did what the first Adam couldn't do. Often Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. He restored the kingdom. Guess what? Then he's going to establish the kingdom for how long? Forever. So there's a restoration work and there's an establishing work. He will be named, we're back in Isaiah, he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast. In other words, he's not just going to rule over a tiny little square on the planet. Jesus would not want to be president of the United States. It's too small a job for him. He's king of the universe. His dominion will be vast. His prosperity will never end. Can I give you a bummer? No? Okay, I'll move on. Can I give you a bummer? <laughs> the prosperity of the United States will come to an end. That's a bummer. I'm not trying to, to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just letting you know, like, Hey, it, it's all going to come crashing down. And as people that are living for a, a different kingdom, we need to be at peace with that. We need to be at peace with that. His prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom and establish, there's the word, and, and sustain with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. Listen, the kings that we have today cannot reign with justice and righteousness. They're flawed. They're messed up. They have their own personal agendas. Jesus Christ will rule and reign perfect righteousness and perfect peace. He won't sweat it. <laughs> and as his people that are part of his kingdom, we shouldn't sweat it either. Now, we'll fast forward 700 years to this man named Jesus. Did you know there was a guy named John the baptizer who before Jesus started his ministry, he told everyone, repent, get ready, because the kingdom of heaven is near. It's getting close. They recognized it. He wasn't setting dates, but he recognized the time is getting near. If you hear people that are setting dates for the second coming of Jesus Christ, you need to run, you need to turn them off, you know, you need to do the block button, whatever it is, you need to unsubscribe from the email list. But don't forget, thanks man, don't forget that God gives us seasons and signs to look for for his future coming. So John the baptizer got it. The kingdom of heaven is near. John 18, there's another conversation I want to bring your attention to. This is between Jesus and, and, a, and a little king, um, Pilate, uh, a governor. Uh, the Pilate, um, verse 33, then Pilate went back to the headquarters and he summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king? It's a good question, right? Jesus answered. You always got to love the way Jesus responds to questions. Are you asking me this on your own or have others told you about me? He wants to know. Do you really want to know, Pilate? If you really want to know, I'll tell you. But if you're just asking me because of what others have said about me, I'm not going to tell you. And here's what Pilate's job is. Pilate works for Caesar, the king. He's the governor. And it's Pilate's job to make sure there's no insurrection, there's no rebels, there's no one that's going to try to overthrow the Roman government. That's exactly what the Jews thought this king was going to do. 
He was going to establish a little tiny kingdom on the earth, a little, a little stamp. So Pilate wants to know, hey, are you trying to overthrow Caesar? Jesus says, do you really want to know? And here's how Pilate responds. I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? And here's what Jesus says. My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. If I was coming to overthrow Caesar, and by the way, what a small challenge that would have been for King Jesus. If I was coming to do that, my servants would fight. But I've actually told my servants to stand down. I've told them not to fight. I told them to put the sword down so that I wouldn't be handed over to, so that I would, um, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus was establishing right before his death he is the king. He has a kingdom, but it's not on this world. It's an earthly kingdom. It is a heavenly kingdom. It is the kingdom of God. And he would restore the kingdom by dying on the cross, paying the penalty for sin, going to the grave, getting the keys to Hades and hell, rising from the grave, and seating himself at the right hand of God to rule and reign forever. He's restoring the kingdom. He has restored the kingdom. And he's establishing the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Those are the two stories I wanted to share with you. Now I want to make a statement. Here it is. Jesus is king. Amen. He is. <laughs> yeah. He's king. If I were to jump into to Revelation, I want you to know that not only did he come as king, he's coming as king, and he will come as king. Revelation 19, verse 11, John describes the revelation that he has seen. And he says, then I saw, in other words, after all the events of chapters 1 through 19, then I saw heaven opened up and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He creates with his word. Guess what? He rules with his word. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not a king. He's the king. So, there's my statement. Jesus is king. But here's my question. Is Jesus your king? We've stepped into a whole different ballpark, haven't we? It's one thing to say that he's king and that he is, whether you accept it or not. But it's another thing for you to confess Jesus as king. Is Jesus your king? Listen, a lot of us, we want Jesus to be our savior. We're drowned in our sin. We want to be rescued from hell and spend eternal life uh, with God in heaven. We want a Savior, and that Jesus is. He is Savior. But he doesn't just want to be your Savior. He also wants to be your king. We want Jesus to be healer, and that he is. We can, uh, we can speak his name, right? But he wants to be more than a healer in your life or a miracle worker in your life. He wants to be the king of your heart, we, we want Jesus to be the one who forgives us of our sin. We want him to be forgiver. And yes, he wants to forgive us of our sins, but he also wants to be king of our lives. Jesus wants to be your king. Is Jesus your king? Um, I want to give you three questions to ask yourself to evaluate this, all right? Because I know we're at church, and you're like, yeah, Jesus is my king, all right? And then we go, and we, and we live however we want. If we go and live however we want, guess what? Jesus is not your king. So I want to ask you to ask yourself these three questions. The first question you have to ask yourself is this. Do I do what he says? Do I do what he says? Now, I'm not saying perfectly, like we all, we all fail, we all stumble, we all, we all goof up. But are you, have you taken your life and reorient, reoriented it towards the life of Jesus? Because he's not king when we say, hey, save me from my sins, but I'm going to go and do whatever it is I want to do. You, you just, you know, I'll worship you an hour on Sunday. That's no problem. I, I kind of like that kind of stuff. But don't, don't bother me on Monday while I'm at work. Don't bother me on Friday nights when I'm hanging out with my friends. Don't bother me when I'm balancing my 
my checkbook. Is Jesus your king? Do you do what he says? Listen, if Jesus is our king, we don't approach him and say, hey, Jesus, this is what I'm gonna do. I want you to bless it. The servant doesn't go to the king and tell him what he, what he needs to do. The servant humbly submits himself before the king and says, what do you want me to do? God, what are you doing? What is your work? And I want to join you in what you're doing because you're the king. There's a humble recognition of that. I want to do what you say. And here's the, sweet, uh, the sweetness of the deal. When you do what he says, there's a blessing of that. There's a fulfillment of that. There is a joy of that. You're not like, oh, man, I got to do what Jesus said. No, there's a joy in serving and honoring the king. Do you do what he says? Listen, Jesus is my king. I don't get to decide how I spend my time. Sure, I put things on my calendar, and sure, I schedule events, and sure, I do all those things, but I've got to hold my time with the recognition that, God, however you want to spend it, however you want to use it, you're the one that gives me the breath. You're the one that keeps this ticker going. How do you want to spend it? Because Jesus is my king, guess what? I don't get to decide how I spend my money. I love when people come and say, Andy, do you believe that believers should tithe today? I'm like, no way. <laughs> Some of you are like, do what? Heck no, you don't have to tithe. Jesus doesn't want 10%. He wants 100%. He wants it all. <laughs> like we, we don't come and say, all right, you get this little sliver. You leave the rest to me. Don't touch it. No, we should honor him with everything that we are investing. And listen, every time we spend money, guess what? It's an investment. Sometimes it's a really good investment like a cheeseburger. Okay, that's a good investment. Okay, you're fueling your body. But every, everything we spend our money on is an investment. Are we investing, investing in eternal, temporary things or are we investing in eternal, heavenly things? He's the king. I don't get to decide what constitutes a marriage. I may have friends that disagree with the king. I don't get to change the king's stance and his authority. He created it. He's the one that gets to say what constitutes a marriage. I don't get to, const I don't get to say, I don't get to decide what genders there are. <laughs> he makes the call. He's the king. Do I do what the king says not perfection but it's taking your life and reorienting it towards the king um, second question you need to ask yourself is this is there any conflict in my life any conflict in my here's what we pray um, God just make everything work out just just thank you for all the blessings and God just give me peace and like make everything just just fix all the stuff so that I live a conflict free life Listen, if a conflict-free life is the goal, then the disciples goofed up royally. <laughs> is there conflict in your life? And here's what I mean. When you're living for a heavenly kingdom, you're going to have conflict in the earthly realm. And if there's, no con if there's no spiritual conflict in our life, if there's no spiritual resistance whatsoever, let me, let me tell you something. You may not be living for the king. <laughs> you may be living beyond, behind enemy lines. Satan may not see you as a threat. Um, God called us to, to plant um, Antioch, Georgetown um, about five years ago. And I want to tell you, some of the roughest, toughest, most conflict, friction points in our life, in my life, my, my, my wife's life, in our marriage, was in the first two years of church planting. That was tough. Now, I'm so thankful that God provided a, a team that was, that was around us, and we weren't going through it alone, and we weren't the only ones by any means experiencing conflict. But I think the enemy knew that God was doing something here. And there was a lot of resistance. And there still is. We recognize that not as something to shy away from, but to press into. I'm not saying you go looking for conflict, okay? Like there's people that do that. There's always looking for conflict. But if we're living for a heavenly kingdom, you're going to experience res resistance in the earthly realm. You'll experience it at work. You'll experience it at school. You'll experience it in politics. You'll experience it with your neighbors. You will experience conflict and resistance. Third question, am I at peace? Am I at peace? See, here's what happens when you live for the king. 
there's a peace that comes in your heart. When you're not living for the government, you know, you're not, you're not living for control, you're not living for retirement in, in, the, in the 401k, you're, you're not living for the promotion, because there's going to be things that happen that throw those things, kind of throws the train off the tracks, and the anxiety starts to come, and the fear starts to come. We start to have all this, this different stuff. But let me tell you something. When you're living for the king, all that stuff can happen, and there's still a peace that's happening right here in our lives. So ask yourself, do I have peace? Because when you're living for the king, there is peace in your heart. Jesus is king, and he's coming as king. My question is, is Jesus your 